Okay, Chris here. This is my second aviation video, my aviation video series. I've been thinking about the direction that I want to take this channel and I've been pretty inspired lately. I've got a book here that I've been going through and it deals with the history of aviation. I've read through the first eight chapters and I'm reading about the pioneers of aviation going back to uh, the days even before the Wright brothers. And so far, every pioneer that I've read about has uh, probably a lot of things in common, but one thing in common that they've got is passion. I know a lot of professionals in the field, and most of these people are passionate about what they do. Um, I'm kind of zeroing in on aviation in particular because that's my field, but I want to I put up a lot of information just about uh, business and professionalism and achieving potential. I've been pretty motivated, pretty pumped up lately. Um, but I'm kind of, I've got the overall aviation theme just because that's what I'm uh, interested in. That's what, that's what I know. Uh, but I've been reading this book and it's for a class. I'm going to get into that later. I'm going to go, go back and do some videos talking about my college experience and what's going on. But anyway, as I'm reading this book, I'm thinking, you know, a really good start would be to kind of discuss, you know, what drives people to go into this field. And so I'm going to share my experience and then uh, some other things that I've come across. And I'm thinking back to, it was a few years ago, I was sitting at the LaGrange Airport. I was on a business trip I had done for uh, the company I was flying for at the time. And we had a good, you know, four-hour layover. And I was sitting there, and this lady came in. And she was flying freight. I think she was flying a caravan. And I was listening to her and she said, you know, I'm not making good money. Flying's gotten old. This is just a job at this point. And it's, it's more of a hassle. I'd like to move on and find something else. And I got to thinking, I never want to get to that point. I love what I do. I've enjoyed it. Um, yeah, there are sacrifices. There are times where uh, you'd rather be doing something else. But I've never lost the drive. I've never lost the passion. And I don't ever want to get to that point. And I know a lot of old guys, older guys, with a lot more experience, a lot more time, many more years in the business than I have, that haven't lost it. Um, they can be grumpy about the sacrifices you have to make, but they haven't lost the passion. So I know right off the bat that there are people that are driven to do this, and there are people that aren't driven to do this. And I think back to... Um, my first semester of uh, flight school. I went to a technical college, a 141 school for aviation. And the truth is, a lot of people wash out. Um, the fall semester, and back then we were on the quarter system, this is in 2001, and you have a boom. Every year it, it would be a larger number of uh, entering students that first semester. And typically within the first two semesters, um, there was a fair amount of those people that would wash out. And I don't know why those people made the decision to end up in aviation school. Because the commitment is tremendous. It's a lot of money. Um, and when you're going into aviation, that's a very specific field that's opening one door, but it's not particularly opening uh, multiple doors within multiple industries. It may be opening multiple doors within one industry, but it's, it's pretty specific. So um, I knew guys that came in and went halfway and dropped out. Um, the people in my mind that made better decisions, if, if they weren't going to go the distance, you know, maybe they dropped out after a quarter. Um, but there's always that. I even hear about that in the airlines. I haven't done the airlines. Uh, I haven't had that experience. Um, maybe one day I'll have the opportunity. Maybe one day I won't. Who knows? But um, I read that uh, even, you know, the people that get to the point where they can go in, uh, you know, for a, a class in the airlines and, and they don't make it through it. I was talking to a guy a few weeks back and he said um, they fly MU-2s on a military contract for the Air Force and they take uh, ex-Air Force pilots through MU-2 school and every year they'll have a couple of applicants are candidates who go through the school and get to the end of it and they say, this is not for me. Uh, and that's amazing to me. Um, 
if that's a possibility for you, uh, my encouragement and suggestion would be try to figure that out as soon as you can. Um, my experience is if you have the drive, you know it. I knew it from an early age, and that's what I'm that's what I'm going to talk about in this video. But um, I just wanted to throw that out there. The 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 real rate of people who wash out uh, during the educational process. Uh, the fact that there are people who wash out even after their primary aviation education is out of the way and they're, you know, going off to the airlines um, or even pilots who have had military careers or other types of aviation careers get involved in a different area of aviation and it doesn't suit them. Um, so that's something to think about. Okay, I've gone over the people who dropped out um, during uh, primary education at 141 school. And the other thing I wanted to hit on is the advice that I got from my high school guidance counselor. So, right before graduation, I was in her office and I said, hey, I've, I've sent off applications to these schools, uh, but I'm going to go to Georgia Aviation Technical College. I'm going to go to college, uh, I'm going to go, go to school specifically for aviation. And she said, oh, Chris, I don't know if that's a good idea. I would advise you against that. And I said, why? And she said, well, if you go to a university, then you get a well-rounded education that opens up a ton of doors. And at that point, you have like the baseline college education that allows you to springboard off into many different industries. And then you can kind of pick and choose you're going to be uh, growing and maturing and learning over the next few years. And so college is a good place to kind of cover all your bases, keep all your doors open. Um, whereas if you go this technical college route, that's a trade. You're, you're going to a trade school to learn to fly airplanes. And that's for the guy who has tunnel vision. And if you think that it's possible that you could end up doing uh, other things, then you know the college route would be better. And uh, she's like, my personal advice as a guidance counselor is that, you know, you should keep as many doors open as possible and go the university route. And a light bulb went off. And I said, technical school is for me. I have tunnel vision. I don't foresee doing anything else. That's all I want to do is fly airplanes. Um, I know guys that did it the other way. I had a guy contact me before we went into our first semester about maybe rooming together. And he had graduated from Georgia Southern with a four-year degree. <laughs> and he was going into 141 school. And in his case, it turned out to be great. Uh, to me, the downside of that is you get into the field a few years later and you start flying later. Um, there's other ways to do that too. I, I know of guys who went to college and then they were doing some of their flight training on the side. Now that's going to slow down your speed of progression on the aviation side. But the four-year degree is very valuable. So everybody takes different paths. But I want to talk to you in this video specifically about drive and about passion. And we're talking about aviation here, but really you want to have drive and passion for whatever field you're going into. If you're going to sell shoes, if you're going to fly airplanes, if you're going to sell insurance, um, or if you're going to get in politics, whatever. I mean, I would encourage you to find that thing that you're driven and, uh, and gravitate towards that. So I knew from a very early age that I had a passion and uh, that advice that I didn't take from my guidance counselor, I still took as good advice. It probably applies to a whole lot of people who don't know where they want to be in five years when they're 17, 18 years old. Um, in my case, I knew it was clear and uh, I'll tell you that story now. So when I was a little boy, three years old, four years old, there was this man uh, his name was Holder Watson, and he was in his 70s. I thought he was a really old guy. Um, and he sat just a few rows down in front of us in church. And I thought he was the coolest old man because every Sunday when I would walk in the sanctuary from Sunday school, I would walk right by his seat on the way towards the back where my family sat. And he would always shake my hand, and he'd always slip me a piece of bubble gum. And he was a... Uh, cheerful, uh, driven old man, and he was the first aviator that I ever knew. And uh, I really respected him. And I remember being five years old and thinking, man, Mr. Holder is so cool. 
he flies airplanes, and I felt deprived. And I told my dad, you know, I'm five years old and I've never had the opportunity to fly. And I was upset about it. So I talked to my dad, and my dad said, you know what, we're going to take you flying. Uh, I didn't know this at the time. I learned this later, but Holder Watson was a flight instructor, and I grew up in a small town, and when he came, he was a World War II pilot. Um, he had flown in the war, and then he, he was farming. He was a farmer in Burke County, Georgia, and he was a flight instructor, and he had a couple of airplanes, and he did flight instructing for a lot of businessmen in town, people that were interested in aviation, and he had actually gotten my dad's private license. My dad was a private pilot. I'll get more into that story in a, in a later video. But um, so one day, uh, when I was five, my dad took me out to the airport. Holder Watson was there, and uh, I found out immediately where he kept all his bubble gum. We went into the trailer there where they had their little FBO, and uh, he, he said, Hey, why don't you go and look in the fridge in the bottom shelf? And I looked in the bottom shelf, and he had just tons of those little rolls of bubble gum. And, uh, so I got me a few and stuck in my pocket. And I said, all right, let's go fly. And so we were in a 152 two-seater. My dad sat co-pilot. Mr. Holder sat in the uh, left seat. And they put me in the baggage compartment in the back. And I, I crouched on my knees and I could lean up and look through in between them. And uh, I just remember from that flight, uh, I remember flying around and being able to see Plant Vogel from the air. Uh, it's a nuclear power plant over in uh, Georgia. And I thought that was really cool. I remember looking down and seeing cars and buildings. They looked like toys. And I remember looking at the uh, at the cockpit and all the gauges and thinking, wow, that looks really complicated. Um, Mr. Holder was very confident. I know he was a good instructor because my dad talked to me about uh, his experience uh, as a flight instructor. He told me the story about him soloing. And, um, I wish I would have known Mr. Holder better, but he died while I was still a pretty young, young boy. But um, my dad always said once I grew up and started playing, flying planes that he wished we could get together and, and uh, have a chat because we'd have a lot to talk about. But he is one of my heroes, and um, he kind of lit the fire from an early age. So we went up for that flight and uh, came down and landed. When I got out of the airplane, my dad said, what did you think about that? And I looked at him and I said, Daddy, this is what I want to do when I grow up. So that business decision was nailed down from a very early age. And I knew it, I kept it tucked away, I didn't think about it a whole lot, but from that point forward, um, I kind of knew. And that was uh, in the back of my mind. So it wasn't until uh, I turned 17, I was getting pretty close to graduating, and people were sending off applications for college and taking the ACT and taking the SAT. And, uh, and I said, well, I guess the time has come, I need to start doing my research. And so the first place I went was I got on the internet and I got in touch with a Navy recruiter because I wanted to fly uh, for the military. And this was pre-9-11 and at the time the military was offering really nice packages. They had large enlistment bonuses and uh, the recruiter came and picked me up and my mama wasn't happy about it. But he took me up to their uh, recruiter office in Augusta and I took the ASVAB. And a few days later, he said, we want to meet with you. And he called me back and he said, we want to put you in the nuclear sub program. Um, your ASVAB score is really good. This is a good program. We've got good sign-on bonuses. It's a six-year commitment. You're going to get an outstanding education. And uh, I'll bring in some uh, specialists to talk with you about exactly what it's going to be looking like. And, uh, and I said, well, that's all good, but when do I get to fly? Uh, can you get me a flying spot? And he said, well, the only problem with that is your eyesight, and we, we can't guarantee flying slots to people who's, uh, who need corrective lenses. And I said, well, can you get me a waiver? And he said, well, we might be able to get you a waiver, uh, but you have to enlist first. And so I thought about it, and my dad and I talked about it, and sometimes I regret this decision. I've thought back on it, and it's a really good opportunity that I did not move forward on, but at the time, I had tunnel vision, and I said, well, if there's no guarantee that I'm going to get to fly airplanes, um, I think I'll find another way. So, um, looking back, you know, I don't know. People always say, would you have done something differently? I would say I felt very blessed. Uh, I'm very thankful for the, the, the opportunities that I've had to 
family that I have now because of the, the decisions I've made and where I was and when I was. So there's so many different variables. But, um, you know, if, if I were talking to myself now back in that position 15 years ago, um, or not quite 15 years ago, maybe 12 years ago, uh, I'd say, you know, think hard about it. You know, those big opportunities don't, don't come around. And at that time, it was a very good opportunity. Uh, the enlistment bonus, the education, and the ability to get started on a military career that young, uh, the guys I know that do it, just, I mean, it's, it's an outstanding opportunity. Uh, the guys and, and girls that, that I know that are uh, military are just outstanding. I mean, that's, that's one thing the U.S. does really well. Um, the training, I mean, our, our military is first class. So um, having missed the opportunity to do that sometimes, I think back on that. But anyway, um, so I started looking around, and I found out that there were uh, a lot of flying schools. Um, I found out that Embry-Riddle uh, was a great option. Um, I heard that it was referred to as the Harvard of Aviation. I started getting promotional videos, and I got really excited about maybe going to college in Daytona Beach. Uh, Embry-Riddle is awesome, and I actually went down there and joined the school, but I found out that it wasn't in our budget. It wasn't going to work for me. So uh, I was able to find out about Georgia Aviation Technical College, which was uh, in-state, so I had in-state tuition. I was only a couple hours from home, and it was a very good fit for me. Now I think back to my time there, and even the instructors, there were instructors who were driven, who had the passion. They were the guys that were there at five o'clock in the morning to get that flight in before the fog rolled in at seven. So before anybody else showed up to school, they already had you know a lesson knocked out. So those driven instructors would gravitate towards the students who were driven, and there were people who were just making progress, boom, 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 knocking lessons out and moving forward. Um, those are the guys now who are uh, captains on 747s. I don't know anybody that's flying 747. Uh, I do know a 767 captain. Um, I know a guy who manages a flight department for a company. Uh, they fly everything from King Airs to Gulfstreams to Learjets, and, and he's, uh, he's my age. It's amazing. Uh, I know another guy that's flying right seat all over the world on a Gulfstream, a G4. I got another buddy that's uh, managing a flight department, and, um, and they fly a beach jet. It's a one airplane flight department, kind of a small operation, but um, I mean, what a job managing a beach jet. So, you know, these were the people that were driven. Um, I know a, a girl, and I found out recently that she works for Virgin uh, Airlines. I've got another uh, female classmate who is flying uh, C-17s. I haven't been in touch with her in the last few years, but she was driven. We would study together. We were both serious about what we were doing. Now, I knew a lot of other people that were not serious, and they didn't make it. You know, they spent thousands of dollars. They were there for six months or nine months, and uh, it wasn't for them. And it's just, it, it blows my mind how, you know, that, that's just a tremendous error. When you look at the investment uh, that's wasted for someone who goes that far in and then walks away from it. So, um, so passion. If you're passionate about it, that's something that I knew. If you don't know um, discovery flights, uh, you know, going to your local airport, getting with a flight instructor, and going and doing five or ten hours, you know, before you commit to a, a two-year program, uh, there's ways to find out what you enjoy, what you're interested in, and I think you should be exposed to your field before you actually make a big investment in going into your field. Um, another kind of milestone for me along the way was uh, at age 12. My granddaddy lived in Cordell, Georgia, and they had a swimming pool. And Cordell, Georgia, apparently is one of the stops on the routes for the glider air races. Uh, I think, I don't know much about this. Um, I remember him telling me at the time, though, that the gliders would do these long cross country uh, races where they would. You know, they would take off from somewhere, and then they would have check-ins, and they would go point to point to point across the country, maybe across the southeast. Maybe it was just a Georgia thing, but Cordell was one of the checkpoints, and so we would sit out at the 
pool and look up and we'd see gliders and they'd get into thermals and go round and round and round and round and I was like, that's so cool. And um, so one day he's like, well, let's ride out there to the airport and see if we can meet some of those guys that fly these things. Um, and it, what he didn't know was there was a guy there with a, with a two-seater glider that was a rated uh, instructor. And so we got out there and he said, hey, would you like to go up in this thing? And I said, absolutely, I would like to go up in this thing. How much is it? And I figured it was really expensive. And he said, well, you know, the glider doesn't burn any fuel. We don't have an engine, so you just have to pay the tow fee to get the thing, uh, you know, up to, up to altitude. And so it's a $30 fee. They hook a, a tow cable up to a, a Cessna, and, and, and we took off and went up to, I think it was about 3,000 feet, and they turned the cable loose, and then we go and find the thermal, and we went round and round and round and round to climb, and I think we spent 45 minutes or an hour in a glider, and I've got pictures from that, um, so I would have been about 12. My sister also went up in the glider. She was nine at the time, just fearless. My sister is awesome. Uh, she was bungee jumping, and she was getting on roller coasters, like, when she was, like, having to stand up on her toes to, to look like she was tall enough. She was, she was fearless from an early age, and so um, I always thought that was really awesome. Nine-year-old nine year little girl going up in a glider. Uh, so my mom got a ride, I got a ride, my sister got a ride. And after that, when I got involved in aviation, my granddaddy always said, well, I guess it was my fault. I shouldn't have taken you out to the airport and uh, taken you, you know, to go get a ride in the glider that day. Um, he was just concerned about the sacrifices that you have to make to go into aviation. A lot of, the, a lot of times you end up with a, with a job and the schedule's pretty tough and you're not, um, you can be away from your family more so than a 40 hour desk job. Um, so there are sacrifices. We'll get into all these different issues more later, um, but in this in this uh, second video in the series, I just kind of wanted to open up and share with you my experience, how I got involved in aviation, how I knew that I had the drive and the passion, and um, some of those steps along the way, and also um, if I'm going to throw out any advice on this one, and this is for anybody, and it's just find find what you're passionate about, put a lot of thought into it. Um, we're all put here to do something and um, uh, you know works good works a good thing and you want to be involved you know performing your work doing something that's meaningful something that you're passionate about some area where we can contribute and, uh, and get fired up about um, I've been doing it for 10 years uh, just a few months ago, I hit 4,000 hours in my logbook, and I still love it. Every time I get to go fly, I'm thankful for the experience. I'm thankful for the opportunity, and um, and I don't foresee that changing. Um, right now, I'm not flying as many hours. Probably going to do 150 hours this year. I used to do 400 a year. I know some of my airline buddies are doing 1,000 a year. Um, I think I would I would probably be okay with that uh, with that schedule as well. I'm happy to be where I'm at now, though. Um, but motivation, I'm reading about these guys, man, the pioneers, the early guys, and um, I, they all had that in common. Um, I was reading, I'm trying to remember who it was in here. It was the, uh, I think it was Alexander Graham Bell, and he was a, he had formed, I forget the name of the organization, but it was a society developed. Uh, dedicated to the development of, of aviation in the early days and uh, he made some some statement that you know you know we work and we and we talk airplanes and we're driven for something like 12 14 hours a day and then we go to bed and then we get up and do it again and these guys were just really driven really motivated and, and on fire and they're the guys that built they built the industry I mean they made advancements that were uh, unbelievable that changed the world and <laughs> my wife's behind me making fun of me uh, that's funny but um so if these guys could get together and change the world we can be dedicated enough to change our lives and get involved in a job that is meaningful and that we're passionate about and so uh, that's that's my message for the second video um, thank you for taking the time look forward for more to come.